and welcome everyone who's with us today, both in person as well as online. It's great to have the opportunity to discuss with you the work um, that we undertook earlier in the year alongside the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership. So um, as a basis for our discussion, I'll provide an overview of the project that we did looking into the skills needs of energy and low carbon businesses across Lancashire. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, I mean, in terms of back background to this um, this issue and the, the project that we undertook, we know that net zero is a key national policy objective and the government has demonstrated its ambition in this area through the 10 point plan it published for a green industrial revolution, which set out an ambition to deliver 250,000 jobs. The net zero strategy, which has just been published um, only yesterday, has built further on on that target and set an objective of 440,000 jobs, um, new jobs to be created um, by 2030. And it also set out an ambition to make sure that the skill system is much more responsive to the needs of employers um, so, so that target can be met and the right skills are um, provided by, by kind of colleges and other providers um, to, to kind of ensure that we have the workforce that's needed. So this project, which I'll, I'll go on to discuss, this um, piece of work originated from discussions held with Michelle and other colleagues at the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership in relation to the types of skills issues that um, are kind of pressing across the county. The LEP is host to a, um, a sector working panel for the energy and low carbon sector. And this panel had highlighted that um, low carbon businesses across the county had been encountering skills challenges. And, uh, and on that basis, we decided to, to kind of explore the issue further through this research. I think it's also worth mentioning that Lancashire is a county host to a range of facilities which support clean energy, whether it be nuclear facilities, offshore wind, green energy. So therefore, it's an important place in which to explore these questions around workforce issues and, and our ability to meet net zero um, through ensuring that there is a skilled workforce for the jobs that will be needed and created. So in terms of the methods we used, um, for this piece of work. We undertook an online survey and there were 53 completed surveys um, undertaken by businesses across the county. We also undertook um, depth interviews. So there were 10 qualitative interviews undertaken from, from that group of 53 survey respondents to really look at the issues in more depth and, and explore challenges um, through those discussions. I'll now just move on to the next slide. Um, so this slide um, kind of sets out some of the key findings and, and what we did see in the results of the survey is that just about half of the sample stated that it had been difficult or very difficult to recruit staff over the past six months. And, and this kind of challenge did come through in other aspects of the survey evidence. So businesses were asked about their confidence across a range of areas, including managing the impact of Brexit, managing the impact of COVID-19 and meeting customer expectations as well. But strikingly, confidence was lowest regarding their ability to find people with the right skills that the business needs. We can also see that just about a third of the sample reported difficulty in recruiting for specialist skills, whether it be kind of software, um, engineers or other kind of key technical roles that the businesses required, but it wasn't only um, those kind of more skilled roles that were challenging for businesses recruit to recruit to, but also skilled trade roles as well. So whether it be um, roles such as electricians or mechanics, um, and, and this came through again in the qualitative engagement. Um, so we heard through interviews that businesses in industries such as construction or manufacturing, they found that young people were not often kind of interested in the roles that they, they could provide. And, that, and part of that was that there wasn't a clear kind of pathway around 
what progression opportunities there were in, in those areas. In terms of what impact these skills gaps and challenges are having on the businesses, we can see that firms are being um, curtailed in their plans for growth and development. So we heard through the survey responses that there's an increased workload for other staff because businesses can't recruit the skills they need. We heard that there had been delays in the development of new products and services. We'd also heard about increased operating costs and there will be additional costs as well. I mean, it could include um, outlay on increased outlay on, on, on contractors um, in situations in which the, um, the staff can't be recruited. And some of these issues were kind of demonstrated in the case study set out on this slide that's in included in the report. This um, business that's um, kind of talked about in this, this case study is a firm that retrofits social housing to make it more environmentally friendly. So that can include um, things such as the installation of um, solar PV panels, for example. Um, but many construction firms and house building companies in particular are now pivoting to include this form of service as part of their overall business operations. But there are widespread concerns that within the industry, there'll be a shortage of the skills needed for this type of decarbonisation work. And this company in particular re relies on apprenticeships and has a strong culture of internal development with apprentices working their way up through the company over time. They estimated that they would need 40 apprentices um, each year, but had real kind of concerns about their ability to meet that just due to, due to a lack of interest in, in the role and, and the, the, the difficulty in attracting young people into the, the sector and, and for their business. So moving on now to some of the other key findings um, that we set out in the report, we found that businesses are in a sense taking things into their own hand by undertaking intensive in-house training in order to fill skills gaps that can't be recruited for. So three quarters of the sample pay for external training. 81% of businesses are delivering training in-house and of, of that um, group of businesses, 65% do so in order to fill gaps not covered by external provision. So there, there does seem to be an issue there in terms of the type of training and provision that these businesses require from, um, from colleges, from higher education, from private providers and, and not being able to find that um, as it's needed for their business. We also heard through the qualitative interviews that businesses often seek candidates with useful experience gained in other sectors that isn't quite what they need, but they then seek to mould those people according to the, the specific needs of the business. Um, and through a significant proportion of upskilling being delivered through internal training, there's also an issue in that workers in the sector will be left without a formal and official endorsement of their skills and development that they would be provided through official training and courses. Um, so that's another issue there which relates to workers in the field. And this case study does demonstrate the very kind of specialist needs of certain firms within the low carbon space within Lancashire. So this company specialises in manufacturing, installing and maintaining onshore wind turbines. The wind energy sector has various subsectors within it, each require very different skill sets. And on top of that, each model of wind turbine is different. So the businesses require highly specialised in-house training. This can be time consuming and expensive. So um, moving now on to the recommendations which we included in the report, we set out a need for sector bodies to survey their members on the skill needs that are kind of pressing within various industries as a lever through which to identify um, which are the most pressing skill requirements and the appropriate routes that employers can take to engage with stakeholders within the skill system to address those. And we also highlighted the need for low carbon and energy sector businesses to offer roles with good terms and conditions, which is a really clear message that we've heard through um, the Green Jobs Task Force report, which was recently published and, and a lot of the government um, documentation on this issue as well. 
and also needing to attract underrepresented groups into emerging opportunities within the sector. And we also set out a recommendation for entry level opportunities to be created within the sector, specifically tailored at young people, um, which could be an opportunity for those um, young people to, to then gain a step foot into the industry and potentially be, um, take on an, an apprenticeship. In addition to that, we recommended that the DWP ensures that job centers and employment support providers are well positioned to work closely with businesses in the low carbon sector to encourage take up of entry level opportunities, attract young people into the sector and increase visibility so that young people are aware of those types of opportunities. Um, and also a recommendation was included that argued for high carbon sectors to be supported, sorry, businesses in the, um, that are high carbon to be supported so that staff within those, those businesses could retrain for roles um, within the low carbon sector. So that's just a, a kind of brief overview of the, the findings, of course. This is all set out in the report available from our website, um, but I'll just pause there and hand back over to Mel. Fantastic, thanks so much, Jin Lee. Um, now, if you, if you have any questions, people in the room, please hold fire just for a moment online. Feel free to start uh, firing away in the, in the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm now going to hand over to our panel. Um, with this being a hybrid event, one of our panelists is actually joining us online. Uh, we have Sam, Sam Alvis, who leads the Green Renewal Programme at Green Alliance, a think tank focused on leadership for the environment. Now, Sam, I know that you've delivered some research on perceptions of green jobs, and you've been closely following government strategy uh, announced this week and, and, wider, and wider work in this space. It would be great to hear a bit more about that work and your reflections, perhaps, on the net zero strategy announced yesterday. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, one of the, the downsides of government releasing 1700 pages of net zero strategy related documentation yesterday was that I'm a bit snowed under, but um, it's fantastic to be able to join you remotely. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the work that we've done, because I think as with any policy, we really need to think about where the public are on this, particularly as they're the ones who are going to be doing the green jobs and need to get the green skills that, that we're talking about. So early in the year, along with Public First, we ran 10 focus groups across the country um, with a variety of class, gender, occupational backgrounds. Um, unfortunately, we didn't manage to cover Lancaster, but it was fantastic hearing the work that you guys have done. It sounds like you've got that well covered. Um, so I'll go into a few of those findings and what I think that means for some of the policy that we need to develop. So firstly, when we talk about green jobs, when we talk about green skills, knowledge in the public is, is extremely low, especially when it comes to specifics. Um, one of the, people tend to talk about recycling people talk about turning the lights off it's they don't really talk about their job being green as opposed to green behaviors in the workplace when we spoke a bit more in depth and we help people understand what some of these job roles are uh we i think people broadly fell into two camps there's those that are excited and those that are nervous and to be honest those are those are kind of two sides of the same coin in the first group, the excited group, it's much more about graduates and younger people that are enthusiastic. So they view jobs in the green sector as modern, they view them as long lasting and virtuous. Um, but the downside is that actually many of them had already made up their minds when it comes to career choices. Um, so they weren't, they didn't feel able to move into the green sector if they're already trained to be a nurse or a doctor um, or even an accountant. For some of the more working class audiences, Green felt very risky. It felt like a pun to a political slogan or a gimmick that didn't really have anything concrete behind it. They liked the idea of being green and supportive of the agenda, but when it comes to their own decisions, things like security, the conditions, pay, all matter much more than the fact that that job's green. So what policy really needs to do is overcome these issues in knowledge and awareness and security. So there's a few ways we can do that, one in communications and then when it comes to actual policy development. So the first is we should be really emphasising familiarity, not always just the greenness of jobs. If we want somebody to sell secondhand clothes as part of the circular economy, we should 
target people who are already working in retail and talk about how actually it's a very similar, almost identical role. Similarly, for somebody spray painting uh, cars now, spray painting EVs, electric vehicles, is not going to be much different. We then need to make it a much safer bet and de-risk the decisions uh, when it comes to moving into green jobs. So stress the long-term nature, take the political out of um, communications and in turn to other people like businesses to talk about things like that and be really specific and tangible when we're talking about job roles and, um, and skills. Stress that green jobs are good jobs. They come with security, they will be well paid, they have good conditions, they're gonna last. Um, and then for the for young people, let's get to them earlier, talking to them throughout school, not just waiting to, to university. So finally, when it comes to policy, and I'll, I'll wrap up here with just a few ideas, and I think they sound very similar to the, to the ones you've been talking about in Lancaster, which is great. The Green Jobs Task Force set out the, the amount of green jobs and green skills we're gonna need across the country. What we don't have is a framework for jobs that map skills and competences, both at the local level and for education providers. So we really need that to be able to understand what, um, what education providers, universities can badge and brand as green courses, where there's a particular strategic need, government should be investing in those specifically. Uh, but in the meantime, just helping people understand a bit more about where these jobs are going to be. So that leads on to upskilling advice services, particularly early careers and then in universities to say, actually, here is a green career, or if you're not in a green career, here are some green things that you can do, knowing it's going to advance your career development to do it. Um, then we can talk about funding to institutions and individuals, which is going to de-risk those decisions, um, helping, like I say, courses, advertise actual green programs uh, mapped to the framework that we've talked about. Loans to help people transition, um, as well as areas like fully funded courses, basically. If we think they're important, we should help people do them. Um, and then finally, who is going to do this matching of demand and supply? So the Green Jobs Task Force didn't go into this level of detail. It's fantastic to have leps here today to talk about that but what we, we need an institution to take hold of this at the local level and say here are our local businesses here are our local education providers here's our local skills need and skills gap and really help help plug that uh, so i'll stop there fantastic thank you so much brilliant well in that case without further ado if i if we come along this way would, would that be all right so i'll next hand over to jess davies who is a professor of S sustainability and director of the Centre for Global Eco-Innovation here at Lancaster University. She is an environmental scientist interested in the role of land and soils in creating a sustainable future. So Jess, it would be great to understand your perspective on this and to hear more about the kind of workforce challenges that are rising through transitions like yours. No, thank you so much for inviting me. I think I, think I can tell I can be heard. It's quite <laughs> amplified, isn't it? It's quite near my, my face, good. So, um, yeah, I'm just really pleased to be a part of this panel and discuss this really important, timely topic with the, the publication of the strategy yesterday. It's really exciting. So first, I'll probably tell you a little bit about what the Centre for Global Eco Innovation does and then how that informs our, uh, some of our perspectives on this then. So the Centre for Global Eco Innovation is a, a university research centre at Lancaster University and we cross cut across the, the institution and we bring the necessary expertise, whether it be from environmental science, engineering, chemistry, or from arts and social sciences, together with businesses in order to develop the products, services, and processes needed to drive net zero and drive sustainable innovation and, and a sustainable transition. And the approach we have is very problem-led, solutions-driven. So we try to understand the business problem first, working with those who are at the, the metaphorical green coal face of implementation to understand what the problem is and bring the right science around that so we can we can collaborate and help uh, make these solutions happen. We've been going for quite a few years um, in various forms since 2012 and over that time we've worked with hundreds of businesses in our region and internationally uh, across sectors on, on various uh, topics and the kind of model we use is an escalator approach. So we like to offer a range of opportunities for, for working uh, with researchers um, from student internships through to uh, undergraduate dissertation projects, one or one to three year postgraduate 
research opportunities through to senior con research consultancy. And by offering that, we hope to offer an opportunity that's right for the, the time and the scale of the, the problem with the business at, at the right time. And I guess in doing that, what's really relevant to this conversation here is, is not necessarily the how the business engages with that, but the fact that that escalator is generating a range of skills in itself within our student populations and in our research populations that, that flow outwards into this industry. And so three insights to share from um, you know, thinking about this question, and it's interesting to uh, hear some of what I'm gonna say echoed already. Um, three insights to share from that then. I think the first important thing um, that uh, we have a responsibility to do as higher education um, providers is to make this industry visible and attractive as, a, as an opportunity for students. And that's something we're passionate about at the Centre for Global Eco Innovation is really highlighting that this is an exciting industry to enter. We're gonna give you an opportunity to do that and really work on a, a problem where you, you, you feel like you're making a difference. And, and you see that in, in the students that, that we work with, um, you know, where, you know where, where they feel like they're making a difference. That can be a very big motivating factor. But those students, they're, they're you know, in a competitive market for, for other industries. And so it's really important that we try to get these students who we know have the skills that are needed in STEM and in other, other areas um, through to this industry and not into industries that are driving consumption. Um, second is I think we need to produce graduates um, and opportunities for uh, creating skills that address the scale of the issue at hand. So the, the scale, the, the deep, rapid transformation that we need across sectors means that actually we need people who are capable of going into the unknown and capable of being adaptive, creative, problem solvers, and, and capable of being brave and having integrity because they're going to have to challenge business as usual if we're going to deliver net zero within, um, within this sector. And finally, from, from, one, from my research perspective, and I see a, a big gap, an important gap as, as skills uh, for net zero around agri-food in particular. I think there's a, a lot of good innovation and a lot of solutions in the pipeline around energy and transport. Um, and still work to be done and skills as, as we've heard that are needed there. But I think we're much less mature on what the skills ask is for those in the agri-food supply chain. But this is a really key part of our action on, on climate change that we need to get started soon. So thank you very much. That's thank you, Jess. The offering. Really helpful reflections there, and I think quite a bit to chew over. I think for us, it, um, perhaps through the, the Q and A. Um, I'll now hand, hand over to to Vicky Nixon, um, who is site training manager at Westinghouse Springfields, which produces fuel for nuclear reactors. Uh, interestingly, around fifteen percent of all electricity in the UK comes from power stations which use uh, Westinghouse Springfields fuel. The business employs 900 workers and Vicky leads their apprenticeship programme. So Vicky, I'd be really interested to understand the extent to which the kind of points that we've discussed, we're discussing this afternoon kind of resonate and reflect your own experiences. Um, and it would great, be great to just hear a bit more about the skills and training um, needs and approach that you use at Westinghouse Springfield. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me. It's very exciting to be out and <laughs> to actually see people, which is great. So as you say, Westinghouse Springfield's not too very far away from here in Lancashire between Preston and Blackpool. Not very many people know where we are or what we do, and we're trying to try to change that. Um, we do generate, well, the fuel we make generates around 15% of the UK's electricity, and that equates to about 32% of the UK's low carbon energy as well so quite quite a big player really which we're very proud of and um, we've been making nuclear fuel for 75 years so we think we've got quite good at it now um, and our clean clean energy technology park at Springfields and um, we're hoping to be part of the kind of new nuclear revolution as well with the new small modular reactors and um, the, the new innovations that come through We've been training apprentices for 71 of those 75 years, not me personally. Um, however, uh, and we have apprentices everywhere within our business. 30% roughly of our existing employees are ex-apprentices. That includes our managing director, it includes myself, it includes the craft people in the 
craft teams and everywhere in between we do say we have apprentices to buys everywhere in every element of the business so that's really positive and it just goes to show that you can you know you can start as when I started as an instrument mechanic quite a lot of years ago I never thought I'd end up being the training manager in the office that we were only ever allowed in if we were very good or very naughty <laughs> and we were apprentices um Regards training needs, we have quite broad training needs. We are a manufacturing facility, um, so we need electricians, uh, mechanical fitters, plumbers, people like that, um, very, very important to us. Um, but we also need um, pellet engineers, people who know about powder characteristics, specific welding um, technologies, uh, people who can do research and development and develop these new technologies for us. So we do have a very broad range of needs. We also, of course, have the kind of the, the people that maybe we don't always sing about in HR and finance and, um, you know, in, in the office areas. They all need training as well. And we can't make the fuel without those guys as well. So we have really broad training needs, like, like any kind of manufacturing site. Most of our skills are from within the workforce. So that aligns really with, with your, your research. Um, we, we train uh, usually ex-apprentices or ex-graduates. They kind of work through the business. We maybe identify a particular talent they have or a particular interest they have in a specialism. And they might then do a bespoke training program with a site expert alongside an academic program, maybe a master's degree or something like that to, to boost their academic knowledge as well. Um, I think that's it regards our, our training requirements. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so finally then, I'll be handing over to uh, Michelle Lorty jones who is Director of uh, the Skills Hub at Lancashire LEP. Michelle, it was you and your team kind of first identifying the skills needs for the transition to net zero um, and the potential for this as a kind of growth area for the county uh, that was the starting point for the research that we've discussed this afternoon. So it would be great to kind of hear a bit more about why net zero skills are so important here in Lancashire and the steps that you've been taking since uh, the research that we ran together earlier this summer to support the development of skills for green, green jobs. Yeah, thanks Mel. And uh, just to reflect Vicky's comments, it is really nice to be in a room with people um, and really nice to meet Melanie and Trinley in person because uh, we've been doing all this work together and I've only communicated online. So uh, really good to be, be in the room. So for Lancashire, um, energy and low carbon. So just to give you a little bit of context, uh, we have around 55,000 businesses in Lancashire, 5,200 of which are businesses in the energy and low carbon sector. So 10% of our business makeup um, is within the sector, obviously really critical. Uh, recent lo local government association study also forecasted um, an additional 44,000 jobs in Lancashire alone by 2030, rising to 68,000 in 2050. So that's the fourth highest in the country as well. So a real high concentration in Lancashire really important fourth highest lep area so yeah which i can see you're looking quite shocked at that and it is you know we were quite surprised at that result we've got a real high concentration so a real opportunity for lancashire you know and we've got strengths in energy including nuclear offshore uh, electrification of vehicles advanced manufacturing chemicals and so on and so forth so there's a significant opportunity across sectors as well as obviously um a challenge as well in terms of um adapting to uh, net zero and um, you know supporting our businesses um, in that but also huge opportunities in terms of diversification and so on and um, so our, for our people uh, for Lancashire residents which obviously are really important to us um, a great opportunity for our younger people for our adult population and to pivot people towards higher value skilled roles to support their economic health and well-being so a great opportunity so in terms of the Skills Hub, um, as Mel mentioned, we're part of the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership, um, supporting them in their work, but also working with the local authorities across Lancashire in terms of that inclusive growth piece and supporting people into work. Um, we have a skills advisory panel. Um, the skills advisory panel is dotted across the country, and that's a board that comes together, industry and uh, educational providers, local authorities to work together on solving some of our skills and employment challenges. We have four strategic themes that we work to. 
Uh, one is building our future workforce, so thinking about our talent pipeline. You know, we've mentioned young people. We have a buoyant careers hub across Lancashire, all 156 secondary schools, special schools, alternative providers, colleges are part of that careers hub. And uh, our mission is to match them all with businesses to produce inspirational careers plans. And we've got thousands of businesses across Lancashire going in and out of our skills and schools and colleges virtually over the last year. We've had to pivot quite significantly, uh, but doing some great work with young people to enable them to get a view into different sectors and jobs. Um, Westinghouse are one of our cornerstone employers within that and uh, helping us on that mission. Technical education is in there, the new T-levels. Um, as well to support young people to pursue careers in different ways and down different pathways. Um, inclusive workforce is our second theme. So that's boosting the employability of our adult population and moving people into, um, into work. Um, a skilled and productive workforce is our third theme. So that's the retraining, the reskilling, working with businesses and particularly at the moment on industrial digitalization as well as net zero and then ensuring that they've got the skills that they need um, and finally taking an informed approach to what we do and so the work that we've been doing with the work foundation has been really useful in terms of building that evidence base in all of that key is integration and coordination so working with employers to enthuse young people about opportunities uh, balancing those technical education routes with academic with employers to grow their own talent so through the new T levels, but equally through apprenticeships and higher technical qualifications um, and drawing unemployed people into jobs by a new innovative program, such as the skills boot camps um, that were first trialed in Lancashire uh, with DCMS um, in the digital space and have been picked up by the Department for Education and are rolling out through the National Skills Fund for Green Technology. Um, so some great opportunities there for individuals. Um, also, just to mention the Skills Accelerator as well, which was launched under the Skills White Paper um, earlier this year. And that was to uh, fund a number of trailblazers across the country um, to test new approaches to drawing employers into, particularly the technical training uh, system. Um, so delighted that we've got two trailblazers in Lancashire, um, one of eight areas across the country, uh, with our chambers, the three chambers across Lancashire coming together with business networks to engage their members to look at what their employer skills needs are. And this is going beyond kind of our evidence base in terms of understanding employment forecasts and so on and growth sectors, but really getting into the ribs of what employer skills needs are and using that to inform local providers so that they can respond more effectively. Um, so that's a local skills improvement plan, an LSIP, a new acronym for us. Um, and um, so that's um, in delivery at the moment and hoping to have uh, the first version of an LSIP come uh, March next year. So quite a tight uh, delivery period, uh, but we're encouraging as many employers to get involved in that as possible um, to get into the ribs of what the skills needs are. Um, DFE hopefully will um, take um, good you know, heed of what comes through that LSIP and hopefully that will influence DFE policy around the funding of provision, the flexibility of provision and so on and so forth. Um, secondly, we've got the Strategic Development Fund Trailblazer, SDF, I love all these acronyms, uh, which is led by the colleges and uh, a fantastic collegiate response from the 12 colleges across Lancashire who came together focused on low carbon and the purpose of the Strategic Development Fund is to provide capital and revenue funds to capacity build the colleges to better respond to the employer's needs. Now, theoretically, you'd have an LSIP first and then a Strategic Development Fund, um, but they wanted to run the two in tandem, knowing that in a number of areas, we did have a good understanding of skills requirements in different sectors. And so therefore, for, for Lancashire, the focus on uh, low carbon. So that project is made up of seven uh, projects with a hub and spoke model across the college network um, from um, car electrification to construction and retrofit to agritech, um, all kind of informing future policy around how we support employers' skills needs. So that, again, is um, an exciting development just kicking off and again running through to March next year. And those two trailblazers will influence future policy um, as we go forward in terms of implementation of the skills white paper. So what's key in all of this is the collaboration between different players in the skills system and our employers.
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I mean, the, as you said, there's a whole lot of new jargon that we're yeah. <laughs> with uh, both in the kind of net zero agenda and also in skills reforms. Um, but it was really interesting taking an early skim through the net zero strategy that was launched just yesterday to see the LSIPs, local skills improvement plans, given a specific mention. So while we're just at the pilot stage at the moment, uh, the work that Michelle and the team and, and colleagues across Lancashire are doing in developing an LSIP will inform work that's happened going to happen in local areas across the country as we think about the specific skills needs of different local communities in uh, developing the transition to net zero. So really interesting to kind of follow that over the months ahead. Now I can see that some questions are coming through. I imagine some of you here might have some questions too. So just as you're perhaps thinking about that, I'll, I'll just uh, kick off with a couple that, that I, I'm personally curious to ask you all. We've talked quite a bit about young people um, and, and uh, each of you have kind of mentioned that in some way about the, the need to kind of attract young people to the sector and thinking about how we communicate opportunities. So I'd like to start with that as a, as a reflection, really thinking about how we can develop clearer career pathways into green jobs to better engage young people. Are there specific partners perhaps that we need to work with uh, in order to deliver that? Would, would either of you like to start off, Vicky or Michelle? I don't want to take me too much of a <laughs> Um, well, I wonder whether as, as industries we need to collaborate on that because, you know, we work within the nuclear industry um, and, and it is a low carbon industry, but perhaps we need to collaborate with, you know, other low carbon industries to, to look at how we generate those pathways as well. And it's not necessarily an obvious green job, is it? You know, if you're an electrician, but you are working in a low carbon manufacturing facility or you're, you're making nuclear fuel or uh, the turbines you were talking about earlier it's about how do we how do we get that message out there that yes this is an electrician which is a fabulous trade to have but you're also within that low carbon workforce yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is about making it real, I think, for many yeah. of the young people. They're, they're kind of, we, we got a real fabulous quote from a young person in Blackpool who said, I need to see it to be it. Yeah. And, you know, it's so true, isn't it? Particularly for young people, maybe from our more disadvantaged areas, which lack, you know, kind of the social collateral from their friends and family that, you know, the more we can do to bring employers into schools and colleges and get young people into business, to kind of, you know, get a real good insight into the raft of jobs that are available, the better. And this kind of thing about green job as well, you know, it is actually, it's it's a specific job, isn't it? It's, you know, it's got this kind of green overview at the moment, but, you know, actually it's about making it real. Um, you know, we know when young people, for example, visit the site at Springfield, you know, a real eye opener in terms of what's behind the gate, if you will, and, um, you know, the different job opportunities. But, you know, we absolutely need to work in collaboration. And I think, you know, we've moved a long way in terms of the schools and colleges and um, the work that we've been doing um, in partnership with the Careers and Enterprise Company nationally and with local businesses. Um, to really raise the profile of different job opportunities. And from a LEP perspective, obviously, we want to ensure that young people are aware of where the future jobs are going to be so that they can think about, you know, the pathways. Um, so kind of defining, you know, different routes, whether that be a T-level, whether it be an apprenticeship, whether it be, you know, via a degree, you know, all these different route ways into different opportunities as well you know, thinking about young people's different learning styles, you know, some people want to do the hands on, as well as the theory at the same time, some people want to go down the academic route. So it's really building that insight and boosting aspiration, giving ambition, and um, really showcasing the different job opportunities that are available and our businesses. Can I come in? Sam? Oh, sorry, oh. please come in, Sam. Yeah, yeah of course. So, um, I mean, your point about uh, local skills plans, just very quickly, was is really interesting because we've had to have a bit of a fight about government, about them officially mentioning net zero in the, the skills legislation that's coming forward. So I think there's still a bit of a job for government to make sure that actually all the, the local plans that they've got mesh a little bit. And there's a real role for local institutions reminding government that it would be a lot easier if everything was in one place rather than filling in four different plans. Um, but on the, on the young people, 
I think I think you're definitely right to focus there. The political direction at the moment is really to focus on the retraining because it's a it's a much more immediate problem about people who are potentially going to lose out from the transition and what, um, how we do with that. But if we're looking to 2050 in a sustainable economy, you need to be talking to people who are going to be in the workforce at that time, right? And that's not just people who are pursuing a solely green career down one narrow road. So for them, for those, government really needs to say, this is a strategic need, we've got a massive capacity issue, and they need to run a campaign in schools to say, here are some exciting jobs that we do there. The bit that's missing that no one's really talking about is, if I'm doing a job which isn't considered green, what are the green skills that I'll need for that job to exist in 2050? So are we helping doctors train about low waste if they're working on hospital wards, for example, are we making sure that carpenters know what the lowest impact, lowest resource use materials are, and they know how to recycle them at the end of their job rather than throw them away. It's all of these individual bits and bobs that we need to just start embedding across the board, not just think about head down, let's get some people into some green jobs. Could, could I perhaps build on that as well? I think that it's a really important thing that we yeah, we need to take care here. We don't, we don't need green jobs. We need every job to be green. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the scale of change that we need. So it's integrating these skills into every, um, in every education and every mm -hmm. preparation for a workplace that, that you are going to be able to, to challenge the, the business model and the way of doing things. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, we, we just need to be a little bit careful with green jobs. <laughs> uh, I, agree. I mean, it was something that we talked about a little bit during the research itself, partly that there's a risk if you just kind of try and describe green jobs as a homogenous group, that they'll be seen as something that's off over there and perhaps not relevant to people who might not be thinking about working in that sector, that there's lots of skills that we know that are really important for the transition that perhaps wouldn't necessarily occur to somebody straight away. Do we think of an electrician, a plasterer as, as, as being a green job? Well, we know they're really important, those skills. Um, but as we've talked about and heard from the panel, then what we're talking about is something that's larger scale. And I, I was just thinking about your earlier comment, Jess, that it's not just about expertise. I, I think that, that point about uh, your comment, Sam, about you know, with whether you're working in retail, whether you're working in... Um, Kind of car uh, repainting and stuff that, that there will be a transition there um, but the point about kind of values and behaviors that you may jest that, that there'll be a need to kind of stand up and challenge the status quo the business as usual practices for people that are coming in to the labor market um, is, is, is really important one and, and there will be some challenges there to think about um I, before i hand over then to to anyone in the audience who wants to raise a question i, I think one of the other points that came through for all of you, I think, to an extent, was the, the importance of kind of local leadership. Um, we know that the impacts of tran the green transition are highly localised. So what steps and strategies do we want to see government uh, developing to ensure that the, the transition to net zero aligns well with the levelling up agenda? And I'll, I think some of that... Sam, you started to allude to thinking about the importance of kind of engagement with local areas and local institutions. Um, but I think one of the things that we're, we're certainly very conscious of is that the, the transition at the moment and the way it's being described with investment targeted to specific sectors and places, um, for some areas, it might feel um, a little worrying, a little concerning. Uh, some, some areas may be concerned that there are real, uh, there's a risk of insecurity um, with, with, with the shift to net zero. So I think we're really interested in thinking about the role of LEPs, local institutions, local authorities, anchor institutions like universities, um, in taking these national agendas and making them relevant um, and working with, collaborating with individuals locally um, to think about what that means in practice. I'd absolutely agree. We've got the network here, haven't we? You know, we we you know we need our local, yeah. I mean, local knowledge, local institutions, work workforces, and and cr I think cross sector peer to peer learning as well yeah. is also important mm. and and valuable. So we need those mechanisms to come that are going to allow those sorts of collaborations. Yeah, there's, there's kind of that that sweet spot, isn't there, with them, the kind of business support. Um, the kind of innovation um, and the skill system and where they come together 
in terms of enabling businesses and giving capability and support to kind of adopt those new technologies or adopt different ways of working, but ensuring that the skills is coming in behind to kind of enable that within the business. So there's kind of a sweet spot in there, isn't there, where you need the likes of um, the business growth hubs, the um, you know business support agencies, the universities, and then the skills system to come together so that we are enabling kind of lo the, the local ecosystem, if you will, and infrastructure to support those businesses to move forward. Um, you know, um, meeting the kind of ambitions within the um, the net zero strategy. Absolutely. There was a suggestion within the there was a suggestion within the Green Jobs Task Force report to have a kind of national transition body that's supported by local transition bodies that would work closely with existing institutions within local areas. And I think for us that that feels really quite important in recognising that well, or perhaps facilitating a shift from a top-down to more of a bottom-up approach to managing the transition. Um, right, is there anyone here that would like to raise a question or should we go to our online attendees? If you pop your hand up, we can either get a mic to you or I, I can, uh, you can, you're welcome to shout out. It's quite clear that it was difficult to get hold of the people who were, had the ability to do all this, but they didn't know how to actually make it work and how to do it. Um, and the reason was because not enough registration was taking place. And they could never have come up with the idea that this may go on and on and on forever and ever, and that uh, uh, two or two down the premises. And it is going on for an awful long time. And even though the income was okay, uh, they couldn't see it as being long term. Whereas in the um, uh, in the media section, you could you could see that going on for a long time. And how do you get certain things? Certain aspects of a new a new piece of work. If you go and do this this course, you go and do this, you do this, you might not pay a bill at the end. Uh, or if you've got a job, it may just uh, say, oh, thanks very much. I think that's a really interesting point. One we've debated about the chicken and the egg, if you so so to speak. So like ground pumps is a classic example where we need the demonstration of demand, if you will to then enable the skill system to train the people to meet the job requirement. But at the moment, it's still quite fuzzy. Um, so therefore, you know, in terms of people having an aspiration to reskill to fit the ground pumps or maintain them or, you know, install whatever, um, you know, you've got to kind of have the demand in the marketplace, haven't you? So there's, there's quite an interesting dynamic at the moment where we're saying, I think it was 600,000 houses a year, was it, in the in the strategy I had a quick scan so don't quote me um, it's a long document uh, but you know um, so where are all those people going to come from you know in terms of installing those ground pumps so you know interesting to know what your perspective is on that as well you know yeah just to, just for the benefit yeah. of anyone joining online that might not have heard the question because I think this is a really important one for us to explore so we're talking about someone who's been involved in retrofitting mm. um, talking about the challenges in finding people with the right skills to do it. But also there's an issue here about demand that you're waiting, essentially reliant on individuals who uh, want to have the, the, the kind of retrofitting work done, as Mr. Mr. Shaw has just been talking about. And it, the, other, the other point that, that comes up there that I think you raised is that some net zero work is going to be ongoing work, as, as you've been talking about, Vicky, kind of thinking about fuel and energy, for example. But there will be some more transitory work that is about facilitating the transition mm -hmm. that, that that might involve quite intensive activity over the the, the years ahead um so retrofitting is a key example of that um but we I'm need to make sure that there's an offer there for the longer term is, is that politically you could actually make a huge difference to that like you could say every time house is sold it's got to be we're just going to get a mic to you, <laughs> just, just to make sure that everyone can hear. 
you could get rid of a problem of the, the worry that with any that any job being trained for, there would not be a job after three years while not bothering doing this training. You can get rid of that, but it would have to be political. Mm. So you'd have to be able to say, retrofitting old houses is going to be needed. All houses, every time they're sold, would have to be retrofitted within five years. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, at the moment, EPC ratings are ignored by people buying houses. And so mm -hmm. they're getting very cheap houses, freezing cold. Mm -hmm. Just to mention, I haven't seen the full detail of this within the net zero strategy, but I did see some of the reporting mentioned that mortgages could be tied to the levels of insulation in the house, and that's a type of incentive that could be put on consumers in a bit of a different way, but government using a lever in that way. So, that, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to think about the range of measures which could be looked at for that. And, I mean, on heat pumps, so I think... We need 600,000 heat pumps per year for the foreseeable. That is, um, we talk a bit about the transition, but the transition is sort of 20 to 30 years. It's it's an awfully long time and well within sort of the working lifetimes of a lot of people who are currently in that supply chain. And the one thing we haven't then talked about is actually you're going to need people to maintain heat pumps. You're going to need the first lot of people who get their heat pumps. They've got the same sort of life cycle as a boiler. They will need replacing. It's the same when it comes to tree planting. Once you've planted trees, you need people to manage sites. Uh, look at what else is going on there, other forms of plants, like care, maintenance, these sort of things. We need to be talking about what the job that needs to happen, not necessarily the full career, and then the other aspects that need to happen after that initial bit of work is done. That's a really powerful point. And um, yeah, I think there was, it was, it's not something that we underlined in the research, but I think it's, re it's a really helpful reminder that we, there is a kind of longevity in green jobs. Um, but I think as, as, as you've talked about at Green Alliance, Helen, I think is really important, uh, is that green jobs are presented as quality jobs and sustainable jobs. Um, so I think you're right that there isn't just this, this uh, short-term, retrofitting work isn't short-term, but there's a, there's a need to communicate that, right? So that people can see uh, work in these sectors as a viable, sustainable uh, career option that offers progression um, over the future. Now, I, I just want to check with um, colleagues that there are, are there are questions coming in online. We that's fine. Cool. Okay. Well, we are, we have just got to three o'clock, um, so I think probably um, we, we might need to wrap it up there. But thanks so much, all of you, for joining, and a massive thank you to panelists for for joining us today. I really appreciate all of you feeding in. Uh, Michelle, a special thank you, and and Vicky for feeding into the research itself. Um, and uh, that we'll, we'll continue to share our, our research report um, and uh, outputs from this event on, on uh, our, our blog and on Twitter. So do look out for that. Thanks again for joining us.